Well, hello. My name is uh, Steve Norning, and um, uh, it's a pleasure, I guess, for me to be able to uh, put together a, a quick little core workshop here for the uh, Wilson Basin uh, Conference. Um, as you might recall from the, uh, I guess, the uh, literature that was put out for this particular conference, I was going to originally do something, um, a core workshop with the Bakken Formation, uh, but as most things in 19 or in 2020 have, have gone, um, things had to change a bit in order to uh, accomplish uh, uh, putting this together. So what uh, eventually came out was we started, um, we managed to get uh, put online uh, this year. Uh, some hyperspectral uh, photography that um, UND, together with Continental Resources and the uh, North Dakota Industrial Commission, uh, built a couple of years ago. And we have this online and available for the public to use. And part of this core workshop is to take a look at the application of some of this hyperspectral analysis with regard to uh, core that we have. And of particular interest, and I suppose uh, try to highlight this a little bit, uh, is some core that we did with the Red River. And um, so, um, with no further ado, let's uh, get into this and uh, see what we could do uh, with hyperspectral uh, analysis of the Red River formation. Well, the Red River is um, located uh, geographically uh, in North Dakota, portions of Saskatchewan, Manitoba, um, Minnesota, and Montana, and outcrops through a belt in Manitoba, it extends down into northern portions of uh, Minnesota and northern Saskatchewan. In North Dakota, um, we have uh, the four intervals that we'll talk about in just a moment uh, outlined in gray, and these, of course, are the primary um, targets for uh, petroleum exploration and production. Uh, stratigraphically, the Red River, of course, is in the um, Ordovician, situated at this particular location within the stratigraphic column. Um, it extends variable various depths, of course, throughout the state. Uh, the core we'll be looking at is located pretty close to the center portion of the map uh, at a depth of about 12,100 feet or so. And geographically and stratigraphically, this is where we find the Red River. And in the particular uh, case of what we'll be looking at for this core. Well, Senec uh, put together a couple of good papers. His most recent one was in 2016, where he detailed the uh, facies that are present within the Red River, and he was able to split it out to about, um, I think, maybe uh, seven or so, maybe eight uh, facies. I've um, s condensed this a little bit into um, the facies that are particularly relevant to what we'll look at in the core today. And uh, we can subdivide the, the basic facies from those that are essentially supertidal in extent up here uh, to uh, subtitle. And then we have a progressive uh, variation in facies associated with water depth and salinities, uh, which essentially um, proceed from deep subtitle where we have skeletal or burrowed skeletal mudstones and wacky stones, uh, intermediate subtitle to restricted uh, subtitle consisting of packed stones, skeletal packed stones and grain stones, uh, or barren lime mudstones. These of course are going to be largely calcitic, uh, however in many instances they are dolomitized. Um, as we move into the uh, shallow subtitle and intertidal, we start picking up thrombolite, thrombolytic um, types of dolomitized rock, uh, laminated dola stones, um, and then um, in the supertidal regime we find intra, um, intraformational breccias, intraclass breccias, and, and hydrite, which represent, of course, uh, hypersal or, I mean, hypersaline conditions that allow for the precipitation of gypsum, um, which ultimately reverts into um, the anhydrous form anhydrite. So we have a full range of different facies that represent differences in depositional uh, water depth, uh, ranging from deep subtidal up to the supertidal environment, which I suppose you could probably look at as being some form of Sabka model. Over here on the right hand side, we have uh, various representations of these different facies as they're developed during different portions of uh, sea level rise. Uh, in this case, we're looking where the purple represents the anhydrite, uh, yellow or the supertidal breccias, and various other uh, facies associated with low systems uh, track as we 
move through transgressive systems track we uh, see the water as uh, sea level comes up we flood the lagoonal salina region uh, resulting in sh uh, deeper the shallow subtidal intertidal supertidal and then at the high systems track where we've built out over the entire thing we've got uh, intertidal to upper subtidal supertidal developing and this broad flat mud flat that's associated with the laminated dole stones uh, our particular well that we're going to be working with is the uh, Vector Nordquist uh, 3423 uh, NDIC number 14815 and it's located right down here in the southeastern corner of Montreal County uh, just off to the east of the uh, Nessanic Line and Alopanic Line um, in this particular area. So uh, production from this particular well uh, was established in the Madison though they did test uh, down in if I remember right to the Black Island. And here we have a scout ticket for this particular well uh, with the uh, particular with its location, its uh, status currently, its uh, plug now abandoned, uh, the log suites associated with this. Uh, one of the reasons for picking this particular well was at first we had uh, used this particular core uh, to hyper to do a hyperspectral scan to evaluate that uh, to evaluate whether or not hyperspectral scans can in fact pick out mineralogies and then we also have this nice log suite to go along with it as well as core information um, and um, core reports. Uh, this well it's, uh, was uh, ultimately completed in the Madison with initial production about 250 barrels of oil per day and ultimately produced something close to about 60, uh, a little over 61,000 barrels of oil, uh, 21 million uh, cubic feet of gas and about 164,000 barrels of, oil, of water. Um, all in all this is a, a Madison producer. Uh, and they did test the Red River with the DST uh, and came up essentially with um, a little bit of water uh, but not much in the way of anything that would consider that would make this to, uh, look like a productive or a prospective uh, play. Um, now for what we're going to be doing here um, this is again uh, subdivisions that Hussainic has put together for the Red River as a, as a general uh, case. Over here is the wireline log for uh, the well we'll be looking at, uh, gamma ray located over here in track one. Um, there's the uh, break between the Stony Mountain formation and the underlying Red River. Uh, we've plotted up here the photoelectric curve in red. And then on this track we have uh, the neutron porosity in purple, density porosity in black, and we can pick out very nicely from the density porosity the presence of these anhydrites that were drilled through. Uh, the core that we're going to be looking at is located down here in what I've labeled a C um, interval. And we can see that we have this very nice uh, anhydrite developed on top of what appears to be based on the separation of the neutron and density porosity curves. Uh, a nice dolomite, which then tails out at the bottom of the, very co of the core in this little limestone interval. Now what we'll be looking at are going to be uh, the textures that are associated with this chord interval and then try to relate that back to this depositional model that Hussainic has put together and then ultimately we're going to take this uh, core and particularly the plugs and whatnot that were taken from the core to evaluate processes and permeabilities and see if we can use those to duplicate uh, the photoelectric effect curve and then use that to come up with a matrix density that's specific to this well using the uh, mineralogy developed from the hyperspectral scans uh, to uh, estimate uh, porosities, a uh, true porosity uh, from the hyperspectral scan and the bulk density log. Well, what we're going to do now is we're going to walk down through the core and uh, look at the various depositional fabrics and mineralogies that are present. Um, so we'll start off the top with uh, the anhydrites that we uh, have, have looked at. Uh, there's some dolostones uh, mixed in with this and we have this nice 
uh, bedded um, and hydrate would suggest, of course, that we have hypersaline waters that are um, have concentrations of calcium sulfate in excess of gypsum uh, solubility. Um, they're layered, suggesting, of course, that they're uh, deposited in um, maybe a salina pond of some variety. And as we work our, our way down through the section, we start picking up these displacive anhydrite textures, this chicken wire anhydrite. And again, this would be um, maybe a little bit more subaerial and not so much subtile, or I mean, um, submarine, in other words, uh, in a pond environment. And as we progress a little bit deeper, these are all largely dolomite with anhydrite mixed in. And again, indicating we're in a supratidal environment. Uh, again, very thinly bedded anhydrites here, a little bit more nodular textures. And you can see that we're migrating back and forth between what appear to be salina deposits and those that may be subaerial displacive uh, types of anhydrite that are forming within this supertidal environment at the top of this um, unit C. Again, continuing down through the section, we can see that we have quite a bit of anhydrite and some more chicken wire, alternating, of course, between the two. And then at this point, we migrate into what appears to have been a calcite. So here we have a contact, apparently, between this chicken wire and hydrite and what appears to be a calcite, a limestone. So this might be the uh, maximum extent of uh, sea level in this instance. And of course, you'll notice it appears to have some um, textures that might be considered to be intraclastic intra kinds of uh, textures formed by an interformational inter breccia. Now as we might head down through the section, you can see we still have quite a bit of calcite involved here. And until we get down in this interval here, where we've changed colors, the textures have become much more massive, and of course this is much more dolomitic. Um, however, we're still apparently in maybe some sort of transitional environment between uh, uh, marine and, and, uh, and the supertidal environments. In here we have what appears to be uh, some little lenticular uh, blebs of what probably were originally gypsum that were growing in the sediment when it was first being deposited. Again, this would indicate a supertidal environment uh, just above uh, high tide. And we move from the massive um, dolostone into this what appears to be a nicely a microbially bedded type of uh, material. Again, it's all dolomite. And as we move deeper into the section, this makes a transition to some more uh, laminated types of um, appearing rock. Again, back to the thrombolytic stuff, or the laminated stuff. Okay, here again, back to the thrombolytic and thinly laminated. And now we start getting the more complex thrombolytic uh, structures. And these, of course, are indicating we're making a transition from a supertidal to intertidal to shallow uh, subtidal. Again, thrombolytic and laminated. So we keep getting these uh, repeating patterns, and this is all dolostone. And continuing on down through this entire dolomite section, and we continue down through the section. Again, not too much change in texture. Now we're starting to get a little bit more massive. And as you may recall, we start to make a transition into some uh, limestones eventually. Still intertidal, supertidal. And then down here we migrate into the parent wacky stone grain stones, which are calcite with burrows that are dolomitic. So this would be the subtidal environment or deeper subtidal. And this is pretty much a full um, Red River cycle we've looked at here, going from the uh, supertidal deposits of anhydrite down through the various facies within the Dola stone section and ultimately ending up at the base with this burrowed uh, wacky stone pack stone section. Hyperspectral scanning has the capability of identifying a variety of different minerals based primarily on the reflectance characteristics that are measured with uh, an instrument that is, takes uh, light between uh, 450 
um, nan nanometers to 2500 nanometers uh, in wavelength and separates them into about 520 uh, different spectral bands. This is essentially the same thing as taking light and splitting it into 520 different colors. Uh, the human eye, of course, uh, can um, record three separate colors and then from that we put together images that we um, call vision. Uh, in this case we're looking at 520 colors and this allows um, allows us to um, make use of subtle variations in the reflectance and absorption of light on mineral surfaces to determine what they are. And it turns out that this particular type of uh, imaging is quite good at establishing mineralogy based on uh, the presence of OH groups in the mineral, uh, water content uh, bound as crystalline water, and it's also quite sensitive to um, minerals that contain carbon, uh, um, the carbonate ion, uh, CO3. That means we should be able to use this hyperspectral imaging to differentiate between calcite dolomite, um, anchorite, um, as well as um, other um, carbonate minerals, but for the case of the Red River, of course, being able to differentiate between dolomite and calcite uh, is an important uh, tool that allows us to um, make use of this imagery um, and uh, uh, not necessarily have to come up to Grand Forks to put a drop vast on a piece of cord to see if it's limestone or dolestone. But what we can do is we can split this up into 520 bands um, with about a half of a millimeter spatial resolution. So each pixel will be about a half millimeter on size side and each pixel will contain 520 layers of uh, reflectance data that then can be used to evaluate uh, and to um, determine mineral composition. Um, and can, these are some of the details. In addition to the hyperspectral imaging, we also uh, collected uh, red, green, blue high resolution imagery at about uh, 50 micron scale. Um, and as you looked at it a little bit earlier, this could be quite good. And then a laser profile uh, of the of the cut cores as well. And over on the right hand side here's a few images of the operation itself. Um, we brought in core scan um, to do this work and they have these mobile labs which are, which are um, built up inside of shipping containers. We have uh, uh, the outside picture of one located here. This isn't in our core facility. This is a standard photograph they've used our core facility. A little bit, uh, well, basically about the same thing um, except uh, we have a a little better setup in some cases. But over here we have the interior of the uh, uh, core scan lab, uh, the computer set up on the far side, uh, the scanning um, component is right, is right here, this is scanning head, and here's the core that's then wheeled down this conveyor belt and it's scanned um, in about uh, five minutes, if I remember right, uh, something on the order of about um, eight, three minutes would take about five minutes or so. And then the imagery is processed. We get the red, green, blue imagery for correlation purposes. And then the imagery is processed into various um, presentation formats. Uh, one that we'll be looking at is simply uh, the mineral uh, class map, which will break out the images into uh, things such as uh, dom uh, uh, cores that are dominated by dolomite, cores dominated by limestone, uh, and hydrite. Those are the three main minerals we look at. And we can sub subdivide those on the basis of color. And we can also um, average across these images uh, to come up with an average mineral composition for, let's say, a slice across each of these images. And we have um, data for that, which we can uh, turn into a, a pseudo log curve uh, for comparison with uh, electric logs. But this uh, one of the reasons that this technology is of particular interest with studying the Red River is that up here in the um, infrared region, near infrared, we're starting to get there's these three adsorption peaks that are caused by the presence of the carbonate ion in calcite, dolomite, and aragonite. And there's a very subtle shift in the peak positions, both the low and high peak positions, that allow for, um, with proper calibration, 
allow for the determination of the amount of calcite that's present in the rock versus the amount of dolomites present in the rock. Okay, what this is, is an electric acid bottle. Instead of running down the core, spraying acid on the core, we can just simply run a hyperspectral scan and then look at the various responses and determine whether or not we're looking at calcite and dolomite. And what we'll do, um, I think, in just a, a couple of moments, is do a couple of quick tests on our core to see whether or not the hyperspectral scans that we have um, available um, are, in fact, doing the job of picking out calcite versus dole stone in the Red River for this well. Now, it also turns out that iron can play a very important role uh, in uh, changing the reflectance of a particular mineral. And we can make use of that, of course, in um, differentiating even further uh, the difference between a just uh, more or less stoichiometric dolomite, one that's got roughly 50-50 magnesium to calcium, versus dolomites that may have um, some enrichment with regard to iron, for example, as they become more anchoritic in composition, we can start seeing these factors roll into the hyperspectral scan. So this gives us another little avenue to work with. Uh, one of the things that was done with all of these scans was that um, after the scans were completed, uh, samples were taken, um, essentially some small powdered scan, um, small powdered um, samples, and then we ran them through the x-ray diffraction machine we have on campus to validate whether or not we have uh, dolomite or calcite or, in this case, I think there's a small amount of quartz present. Um, as well as uh, anhydrite. In this way, we calibrate the hyperspectral scans to the x-ray with the idea of building confidence in our results. And ultimately, uh, I think we are, we're not done with this process yet, uh, especially with regard to some of the clay minerals and some of the other formations that we have scanned. But it's a um, work that uh, will ultimately, I think, result in some very fine, uh, a very fine way of evaluating mineralogy um, without necessarily having to pour out, pull out the core uh, to take a look at it and to sample it and they have it analyzed. Um, now this is just simply the code sheet that we use for colors. Uh, these are the various minerals that can be identified using hyperspectral scanning. And the ones that we'll be most interested in will be calcite and dolomite, as well as iron-rich carbonates. And I think we also have a subdivision for uh, iron-rich uh, dolomite, um, chlorite, um, not so important in the Red River, of course, but in other formations it is. Uh, various uh, clay minerals. And these are the primary minerals that can uh, be analyzed using hyperspectral scanning. Well, according to our hyperspectral scan, uh, we've got two mineralogies sitting in here. This one should be a, a calcite or limestone, this one dolomite. And so let's see what uh, the acid test tells us when we put a drop of acid on the calcite. Obviously, it's fizzing, uh, effervescing uh, vigorously, whereas when we put the same acid drop on a dolostone, it takes a little bit longer for it to effervesce. So obviously, we've got calcite, dolostone, and the hyperspectral scan seems to do a very good job of being able to differentiate between the two. Here we're looking at a section of uh, packstone to waxstone. Uh, again, it's burrowed a little bit. You can see right here. According to our hyperspectral scan, that's supposed to be dolomite. This is supposed to be limestone, so we'll test that with a simple drop. Okay, very slow fizz and rapid effervescence. So again, it looks like the hyperspectral scan is able to differentiate between uh, calcite with the rapid effervescence versus the dolostone with the much slower effervescence. Okay, in this case, what we're looking at, we're going to come up here to just above 12129. And according to our uh, hyperspectral scan, this should be all dolomite. And we'll run a line of acid down it. And uh, yes, it's again effervescing very slowly, indicating that this is um, uh, largely a dolostone. So again, um, looks like the hyperspectral scan is working out OK. Now the next interval we're looking at is uh, well, 12127 right in through here. Yeah, you might remember this is a uh, laminated uh, dolostone, but there's something interesting with on the uh, hyperspectral scan because it has this rather weird purple color. And it turns out that weird purple color is caused by the presence of, according to this hyperspectral scan, mineral carnalite. 
Uh, carnelite is a um, magnesium chloride uh, salt. So this suggests that maybe we've got some salt in here that's uh, um, giving us a, an impression that it's uh, salt mixed in with dolomite. Well, in this instance, we're looking at a uh, section of thrombolytic uh, dolostone. And uh, according to our hyperspectral scan, it should be dolomite. And it appears to be a very slowly uh, reactive material. You also noted on the hyperspectral scan saying that it contains a significant amount of carnelite. And carnelite is a, a magnesium chloride salt. So there's uh, something interesting going on here. I've got to check out one of these days. A well, moving up section to the uh, microbial matted dolostone. Again, just to double check the uh, composition of this stuff. According to the um, hyperspectral scan, it should be dolostone. And as you can see, it's really pretty unreactive with regards to the uh, acid. So apparently this is uh, another uh, point where we can trust the hyperspectral scan to give us a pretty good idea of what's going on. In this case, we're looking at the, what looks to be a fairly massive dolostone. And you'll note there's a little bit of gypsum, or at least some of these would appear to be gypsum uh, displaced of, uh, crystals in here. And we'll check the hyperspectral scan. Okay, that's pretty unreactive. And it also, you'll note from the scan, it also contains this carnelite salt uh, incrustation. So again, one of these things I've got to check out one of these days. Well, in this instance, we're looking at uh, what appears to be an interformational breccia. And uh, underlying it looks to be uh, an anhydrite. So let's again do the acid test. And yes, the hyperspectral scan says we have a contact here with limestone. And there it is. It's fizzing as if it was calcite. Um, so again, the hyperspectral scan seems to be able to pick this out rather nicely. Here we're getting near the top of the section, and we should have a contact between anhydrite down below and dolostone above. Neither of which is particularly reactive to acid. Last thing I'd like to do right now is to, I guess, try to do a little bit more ground truthing uh, for this hyperspectral scanning uh, to see if it provides us with information uh, that might be useful. Um, and what we're going to do is that one of the things that, uh, the hyperspectral scan uh, provides us with a little bit of processing uh, is to take uh, individual lines of or rows of pixels through the image and then average those out to come up with a percentage of the various minerals that are, might be present. Uh, the system itself, I believe we've got it calibrated now to maybe identify some 34 minerals. Um, in this case, we're going to be looking at only three uh, anhydrite, calcite, and dolomite. But what we can do is you can, uh, we've got a, a, seri a series of files that have been compiled that contain these mineral fractions um, throughout uh, the section. And so we'll take the average value for a row of pixels uh, that contain, let's say, the percentage of calcite, dolomite, and hydrite, um, and uh, maybe some carnelite might be thrown in there. But what we're looking at is taking those values of calcite, dolomite, and hydrite, and then summing those up to one, so we have a fraction of calcite, dolomite, and hydrite, and then average that over, uh, say, two feet of vertical uh, core. And so in this way, we end up with a curve. And the point of generating this mineral curve is then we're going to see if we can calculate a photoelectric effect. And since this particular core that we've been looking at had a photoelectric log run with uh, the bulk density uh, neutron curves, um, we can uh, make use of that maybe. And so what we're going to do is calculate a photoelectric effect based on the percentage of calcite, dolomite and anhydrite that the hyperspectral scan detected. And then we'll compare that photoelectric effect to the one that was run uh, with the open hole tool. So the photoelectric effect we're going to look at, uh, we're going to take the value for the, uh, the fraction of calcite, multiply it times the photoelectric effect for calcite, uh, dolomite times photoelectric effect for dolomite, and the same thing for anhydrite. Sum those products together to come up with a total of PE of, and then we'll plot that and see how that compares with the photoelectric effect measured by the logs. And then since we can do um, 
the photoelectric effect, well, let's go ahead and do the same thing uh, with regard to the grain density. Since the hyperspectral scan doesn't see pore space, uh, we should be able to get a good grain density just by identifying the minerals that are present and the percent of those minerals that are present. Now remember, um, we have, we're looking at a flat surface, we're not looking at a three-dimensional volume. So this, of course, uh, has the potential of generating possibly some errors. But nevertheless, uh, let's see how this works. But the way we do that, of course, is we can uh, take the fraction of calcite that's present, multiply it times its density, same with dolomite, times its density, and then hydrite, sum those together to give us the matrix density of the uh, image or of that row of, uh, of pixels and then from that we can then calculate a porosity value if we have a bulk density curve along with our matrix density which is calculated here to give us a porosity based on the minerals uh, obtained uh, observed by the hyperspectral scan and the bulk density measured by the um, uh, bulk density tool. So let's take a look at the logs. Um, over on the left hand side we have the gamma ray logs for this interval. Here's the chord interval that we've been looking at. Um, we use that for calibration purposes. But right here is where we have the photoelectric log. Uh, the observed or the measured VE curve uh, from downhole tools is in red. And the photoelectric effect that we calculated using the percentage of the mineral percentages that were present in the uh, scanned image is in black. And I think you can see it's two trace quite nicely throughout the entire section. So it looks like the hyperspectral mineralogy that we obtained when converted into a photoelectric response um, matches quite closely the logged interval. Now we can take this one step further and compare or calculate the matrix density from those mineral fractions and the known values for the density of these minerals and calculate that with the solid black line through here and then we compare that to the density curves or the density uh, grain densities measured at specific points throughout this curve. Those are the values that are plotted as green circles. These are core-derived uh, grain densities. And then we have plotted on here the bulk density curve as well. Now what we're going to do with the third one, of course, is take this matrix density that we calculate using the hyperspectral scan and use that to calculate porosity. And over here on the uh, right-hand side, we have the bulk dense, or the density porosity curve. As you might expect through dolomite, it's rather negative. It's in the rather low compared to the neutron porosity curve. However, we have the hyperspectral curve in orange and the core derived porosities. Um, they match reasonably well. So it looks like, uh, at least on the basis of this very simple um, example, but the hyperspectral scanning in mineralogically simple systems are fully capable of uh, determining things such as photoelectric effect, uh, possibly useful as a, a way of estimating grain densities on a fine scale, and ultimately maybe give us a picture of porosity as well, as long as we know things such as the bulk density, cur uh, bulk density readings. So, um, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for uh, your attention and I uh, hope you found this uh, as interesting as I did in, in putting it together. Well, this project has uh, benefited enormously uh, from uh, generous uh, support from Harold Ham Continental Resources, um, the private-public partnership uh, between Continental Resources and the Petroleum Research Fund of uh, the North Dakota Industrial Commission, um, uh, their assistance in this project is gratefully acknowledged. Um, also, the North Dakota Geological Survey, um, they supplied uh, the manpower and much of the muscle necessary to move 
what amounts to several tons of rock off the shelves, on the pallets, through the instrumentation that um, produced these hyperspectral scans and then back up on the shelves. Um, and I gratefully acknowledge their help. Um, CoreScan itself, um, the company that did the hyperspectral scanning, uh, did a considerable amount of additional work uh, beyond uh, just simply scanning the uh, rocks. Uh, Brigitte Martini and uh, Lionel Fontenot both contributed considerable uh, information and, and expertise with developing uh, the mineralogies that we have uh, established with the uh, uh, hyperspectral scans. And then Brooke Brunson, a uh, PhD candidate at UND, who um, spent some time um, conducting the simple little acid drop test versus the hyperspectral scan prediction. Uh, and came up with a set of statistics that gave me the confidence to go ahead and uh, do this particular core workshop.